Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to officially welcome you to the Stockbridge Library, Museum, and Archives online poetry series. We are in season two of our online series, and the, the theme for this season is the refuge of witnessing. And we have had numerous poets join us over lunchtime on Thursdays to discuss the theme and read their poetry. And we are very lucky today to have with us Myra Malkin, who will be reading some of her poetry and sharing her process with us. Before we begin, I do want to thank John Gillespie, who is the organizer, host, and moderator for this program. John, thank you for bringing poetry into our lives each week. We couldn't do it without you. Um, and just a few words about Myra Malkin. She is the author of No Lifeguard on Duty and Sunset Grand Courier. In 2016, in a contest judged by Edward Hirsch, her poem Wallace Wallace won the 12th Mudfish Poetry Prize. Um, I do want to mention that Edward Hirsch has joined us here, Stockbridge Library Zoom programming as well, um, which was also fun. So after growing up in New York City, Mara studied acting at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. She was a founding member of the New Repertory Company, an off-off-Broadway group that performed actually in a former funeral parlor. She then attended Cornell Law School, and then for 15 years was a legal services attorney in upstate New York. Um, Myra is joining us today from Manhattan. Myra, thank you for joining us. Welcome, and John, thank you. I'll now turn the program over to the two of you. Yeah, thank you a lot, Wendy, great. No, thank you, uh, Susanna and Donna for being here. I think this is show 78 or 79, so uh it's it's really been a a weekly time for me to plug myself into the poetry wall as i call it and just kind of get just re reinvigorated so myra you know we start the same pretty much every week you, you know what does refuge mean to to you and like where where do you find it now you know, it's strange. You had said you were going to ask that. And when I started to think of what's, what are my refuges, I came up with a very long list, family, friends, reading, writing, involvement with other arts, architecture, dance, uh, walking in the city, coffee. And it struck me that if you'd asked me to make a list of pleasures, that I would have come up with pretty much the same list. But when I was young, I, I didn't think of refuge and pleasure as the same thing. I thought of refuge as something you kind of shrink into and pleasure as something you splash out into. But I think getting older and also the past few years, wow. um, the pandemic, Ukraine, climate change, that that's change things so that very everyday things um, have started to seem very precious and have started to seem like refugees, refuges. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was, um, I'm an impatient cook and I was chopping tomatoes for a salad and I was thinking how boring it was. And, and then I thought, I'm in my own house I have a roof over my head. I have food to eat. I have heat. I have water. I can probably knock wood, go out into the street without getting shot by a soldier. I, what could be better than being here chopping tomatoes in my own house? And I, I, I don't mean that I'm as philosophical as that most of the time. Most of the time I'm grumpy, you know, and, and mind chopping tomatoes. But it has... I do, I do very much notice the pleasure of just everyday routines and the things that I do every day and it, they, they mean a great deal to me. Yeah, I thought, uh, you know, I don't know if, if I'm saying the word right, uh, prescient, 
PRE, you know, like predict, like predicting. I don't know how to say that word either. <laughs> yeah, but I, but I think the title of your one of your books, "No Lifeguard on Duty." Mm -hmm. I feel I don't know if that's the you know like the subtitle of life right now. Good luck. Go out there. There's no lifeguard on duty, and hope you stay safe. No, it, it's a uh, you know, it's like, what are that, that saying? It's the best of times and the worst of times. It's like, right. I, I appreciate a lot of everyday things. But where, let me ask you this, where, you know, do you see your friends? I, I always ask this too, is do you think people, I mean, in the pandemic, the first pandemic year, I mean, everyone was at home. So home was the refuge. <laughs> and, you know, do you see, your friends kind of seeking more refuge now or kind of leaving that behind and kind of saying, I need to kind of get back out in the world? Well, I think very often going back out into the world is, is a kind of refuge. You, you want the, um, the relief, the um, normalcy of being on the street, uh, having lunch at a restaurant, being face to face with somebody, I, I don't really see them as opposites out and in. Okay. Okay. Are there a couple of poems that you had picked that might talk yeah. about refuge or sure. talk? Yeah. Um, most of these poems are from the book that just came out. I guess I should hold it up. Uh, the Sunset Book. The first poem, um, well, I have a daughter who has lived in Japan for many years. And when she first went to Japan, I thought that I should read the great Japanese novel that was written by a woman around the year 1000, The Tale of Genji. And I did read it and I loved it, but I got very fascinated by the guy who translated the version that I read. He seems to have been a very cantankerous guy. His name was Edward Seidensticker. And I started feeling very protective about him. I don't know why. So this poem is about him, but it's almost entirely made up except that there are two first person passages that I adapted from a book he wrote about doing that translation. A Genji translator visits an exposition. At the pavilion of the human passions, he ate frit from a paper punnet. He searched for what was covert on celadon saucers, inaudible peonies, ghost shapes. He gazed at alter calming votive objects. I have understood these last few days why old people kill themselves in spring. To feel life all around you and to feel no life within. Pathos of pottery fragments an ochre stoneware stack of stuck to one another serving dishes. At least I have my Genji to go back to. I swear I will go back to it tomorrow. At the pavilion of the human passions, a printed label listed five desires, sex, food, reputation, property, sleep. He looked for omens, he asked the poem cards to tell his fortune. The good will not be solitary long. I guess that's about looking for refuge. The next poem is about my daughter when she was little. I want, I want forever and ever. Before she goes to sleep, I read a bedtime story to my daughter. I have to read it twice or even three times, each sameness like a promise that's unbroken. It's as if she already senses that time will repossess the child's carte blanche, her cornucopias. 
but here in her sleepy palace, she has it in her power to make the present last and last and last. Read it again, she says, imperious daughter. Read it again. The next poem is about a painting. Um, it's a painting I saw and remembered wrong. Um, a painting by Orazio Gentileschi uh, of the two sisters in the Bible, Mary and Martha. I understand that Mary um, is sometimes confused with Mary Magdalene and some people think that she's the same as Mary Magdalene. Anyway, there's a baby in the poem that wasn't in the painting. I just remembered wrong. I dream of an imaginary mirror. A mirror is propped beside the satin lap of Mary Magdalene. Upon that lap at ease, a chubby baby lies. The mirror frames the polyhedral folds of white and purple silks and elbow flesh. Mute landscape into which a sleepy child might press blind open mouth, a hide and seeking face. Like the flaw that the maker leaves to tempt ill luck to exit in the crimson and dead leaf beige of an opulent carpet's arbor of half pommets. This brush stroked mirror serves as aperture, as doorway into rest. An Eden swatch, a square of abstract pattern among stuffs. Inside it, nothing but silk syllabub of touch, pellucid sleep, skin's heat, clouds color flush. The last of my um, refuge poems is about a, an Irish poet named Louis McNeese, who was in all the anthologies of my youth. It, it starts with a, uh, an, an epigraph by McNeese. Reading McNeese. Dissolved in the running water of time, we fool our fancy to catch intact what is always in dispersal. Louis McNeese departure platform. Haven't read through the collected poems, but even if I had, if I had pencil marked lines I especially liked, world is crazier and more of it than we think. Would I remember those lines? One poet, one collected poems, one life, so much to know about him, to forget. When his mother died, he was five. He started writing poetry at seven. The party he spent by a mantelpiece, elegant, silent. His host said, is it true you were brought up in Belfast at Carrick Fergus? Yes. Ah, that confirms a legend I have heard. A long time ago, seals invaded that coast and interbred with the folk there. <laughs> Even when I copy whole poems into my current notebook, some of them slide from my head like keys from an unzipped purse. I go on doing it though. Those hospitable notebooks, those cabinets of curiosities. It's like somebody taking selfies. Buckingham Palace and me, Louis McNeese and me. Why this compulsion to cull, to salvage sea glass fragments? as if I'm stuffing loot into a too small sack and running from a wreck, though it's I who am going to sink and all too soon. As I am drowning, I'll wave as well as I can. My darlings clutch to my chest. Thanks. Woo, all right. Very good. Uh, Let's, we always have a little, little Q&A break for the uh, people in attendance to ask any questions they may have. 
I think Donna knows she's been on a couple of shows and uh, uh, Pat, you haven't been on in a while. Uh, this is, uh, I always say, don't let the poet off easy. Now's the time to kind of ask, uh, well, I think Myra, if you read that one, you know, the, the questions that have no right to go away. Yeah, yeah. that David, what that David White line just yeah. keeps running through my head. I keep asking myself, what question am I avoiding? Mm -hmm. Now, does anyone have any comments or questions? You can put them in the chat or just unmute. Donna, go ahead. Yeah, Myra, I really enjoy your poetry and your reading is is very elegant. You you do so much justice just reading it to us. Um, I'm wondering about the legal profession, and I have known you know lawyers who they always turn to writing, and I wonder. <laughs> uh, and it was like John Grisham. I mean, there's famous ones too, but um, I just wondered how that, if at all, informs your poetry. Well, um, it's funny. I've noticed over the years that enormous number of artists started out going to law school, you know, in the old days, not necessarily law school. And their fathers wanted them to go to law school. They were mostly men. And, and then they got away from it. I actually enjoyed being a lawyer. I have a funny thing to say about that. I think I, I've been writing poetry for many years, but I was always very frightened when I wrote it because I would, I, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who writes a perfect first draft, far, far from it. And I would be so disgusted by the first draft when I wrote it down and I felt despairing. I felt, I can't, this is awful. But when I was a lawyer, I had to serve my clients. I had, to, you can't go to court and say, a dog ate my brief, you know, you have to, you know, have to do it in time. And so I, I learned that I had to get something down on the page, get something down, doesn't matter, don't worry about it. And then when there's something on the page, you're not filling a blank page, you're revising. And Revising is easier because you can look at it and say, that's not good, I could do this. And even though, thank, I, I mean, my, I finish my briefs much faster than I finish the poems, which often take me years, but that was a huge help. And I, I learned that from law. Um, I didn't have a, you know, I was a legal services lawyer. It wasn't a very high powered um, career as a lawyer, but I was fascinated by my clients and um, I, I guess law, you, you do, it does, um, you, you do need to have a respect for words. Words mean very particular things. And that maybe, I'm not sure, carries over into poetry and wanting, wanting to be, not just to take the first word that comes along, but to really think about, is this what I mean? Is this, is this the best way to say it? Is there a better way of saying it? So it's kind of a muddled effect, I guess. Oh, very good. Anybody else? No, not hearing anything. So let me ask you this before we move on to the, the, the second topic. You know, what really inspired, you know, how do you start the creative process? Because I know, obviously, you, you do a bunch of acting. Yeah, I'm just, you know, the whole thing is, I feel like you have multiple lives to draw from. You know, the legal part, the acting part, there's so many avenues for you. How, do, how does a poem start? Or how does it, is it one way or is it multiple ways? I have to say, it seems entirely random. Um, I Sometimes I'm desperately looking for something to write about, and sometimes I'm writing down lots of notions. It, it, it seems to start from something small. Sometimes it's a line that comes into my head. Sometimes it's a dream. Um, 
Sometimes it's a topic. Uh, and as I say, I try to slap something down on paper. Yeah. And sometimes I, it just stays on that small thing stays on paper for a long time. And then I, I go back to it and I work on it. And it, it still doesn't seem to amount to anything. And I go back to it the next day, the next week, the next year, and suddenly something clicks and I want, I, I want to change it. I want to keep working on it. I, it it's as if it, it gels, not into a finished poem, but into something that could be a finished poem. I'm sorry to be so vague, but it, for me, it's a vague process. No, uh, listen, we've heard you know, discipline writing at 5 a.m. every morning to, you know, a line pops in your head, you know, with, uh, you know, I, I wish, Wendy, we could, we could pull little snippets out of every conversation. We, we'd have 50 different, you know, I don't know, what was that song, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover? This is 50 <laughs> Ways to Write a Poem, Start a Poem, so. Uh, it would be an anthology, that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, no. I, I was no, I think there is a, yeah, go ahead. No, I, the, the poet, uh, is it Andrew Davis was his name? He said that he wrote out in prose his poems at the beginning of the process. Yeah, Adam well, O'Davis. That was so yeah. interesting, yeah. Yeah, so we, we did have a question uh, from, from uh, Pat in the chat. It said, when did the shift to feeling slash seeing, I guess, seeking refuge almost everywhere or in each moment begin? Or what no, it's it, it, seen. Oh, seen? Mm -hmm. feeling or seen refuge uh you know when did it what was the moment it began and what facilitated that awareness yeah it seemed like you were speaking to a, a, sh a shift that happened for you and was it just what facilitated it the pandemic the growing older uh you know life life experience that's interesting. I, I, I think it's partly gradual. I, I think that at the beginning of the panic, of the pandemic panic, it was, you know, everything was so strange. And I was spending a whole lot of time at home, whereas I'd been spending before that, I'd been spending a whole time, a lot of time outside. I, going to the ballet and things and walking. And my, my home was more chaotic than I realized. I, 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 you know, I hadn't spent a lot of time in the kitchen. I had, I'd eaten out a lot. I um, gotten takeout food and really my kitchen was in certain ways a disaster area. And so there were a number of months when I was sort of shifting to making, making my home different so that it was a place that I could cook in and a place where there was for masks. And um, I guess that some time, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm only guessing about six months after the pandemic started, I, I had, I had regrouped and in terms of my mind or the house and um, the, the apartment and 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 also was remembering things I couldn't do that I wasn't going out and stopping in at a coffee shop and having coffee and reading the paper which I is one of the things I missed most um, you know silly little things like that so I think that's when I began to think differently about it. And also, this has been a time uh, when a lot of my friends have not been well. And so I'm very conscious of what they're going through, their difficulties, um, just how fragile everyday life is, and in so many different ways. So I guess all those things, I mean, because of COVID, but also because of other illnesses, because of deaths, 
um, and then reading about Ukraine, so, so conscious of, you know, this suburb, this tree-lined suburb that is now full of bodies and dead cars and all those things, I think, have contributed to that. Hey, and, Pat, why don't you read your follow-up question? Yeah, and did it change that level of presence? Did it change the frequency or the rapidity of poems coming forward? Or has that, that been just a continuous, no matter what? I don't, I don't think it changed things, but I was home more, so I had more time to write, and I was more disciplined about writing in that sense, yeah. It's an interesting question. Thank you. So let's move on to my favorite topic. I mean, this weekly show is my one of my refuges, but yeah, witnessing. Uh, witnessing to me is the wild, wild west, a vast landscape that can barely be captured. So what is what does witnessing mean to you? Well, I think that I have mainly thought of witnessing in terms of, roughly speaking, political things or things that affect not just me, but a larger community. I, I don't, I'll say in relation to one of the witnessing poems that I, I also think witnessing can be more personal. Um, but certainly in the last few years, so much, um, so much has happened that I, I, it's not, I don't think that, I, you know, any poem that I write is going to make any kind of change, but it seems, it seems right to take notice of certain things that are happening to, to, uh, not to let them pass, even if nobody reads the poem, uh, nobody knows about it. it. It's it just seems like a kind of respect paid, and I, I find political poems hard to write because it's it's hard not to be preachy. It's hard not to be prosy, um, and I I have. Uh, a number of such poems that I, I'm still struggling with because I, I don't feel I've gotten it right yet, I hope. But I, I, I you know, it just seems important to acknowledge things that are happening out in the world. That's good. Yeah, I think one of the things I, I ask about is you know, do you just think with all the things that are, you know, you probably, do you read the Times every day? I do. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I do. I read a bunch I, of it. I, too. Don't, I, don't, I don't read every single thing, but I, I, you know, I register each article. I still read the paper paper. And yeah, yeah I wish I had the paper paper. Yeah, we, we even in Stockbridge, Mass, the, the delivery was, was not great. So we went to a virtual, or what do you call it, online. So, with all the things that, I mean, just read, the, I read the Times front page every morning, so, or, or in the afternoon also. Do you think we're reaching kind of a witnessing overload where there's just so much, you know, it's like a, it's like a container that's supposed to hold a quart of water, but somehow there's three or four quarts that are, that keep flowing into it. So it's just stuff just flows over the top. Do you mean, an overload in the sense that people can't take it in anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, they, like there's so much to witness. You know, you can't process it or it, you're numb to it or you can't make sense out of it. I'm just wondering if there's just so much stimulation. That, you know, I think because part of it is witnessing and stopping. And I think there's an appreciation. And I feel like there are so many things that are just coming at us. I'm just wondering if if we're turning off the witnessing button in our head and just saying, you know what, let me go on autopilot, not register all this stuff that's happening out here. Well, I think there's 
certainly an overload of information and a terrible overload of bad things. And I think probably people need to have as a regular thing in their lives, uh, sometime when they turn that off, um, whatever their way to escape is, because I think you 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 go crazy if you don't do that. Um, I whether I I don't think though that you know, one of the one of the I, this is a little. One of the things that the question, the lines that keeps being in my head is, is, um, is a line from King Lear where Lear says, is there anything in nature that causes these hard hearts? And it just gives me the chills that line. And I, you know, I think of it because there seem to be so many hard, you know, aside from uh, hurricanes and and the pandemic in term in human terms there seems to be so many hard hearts that are doing terrible things i i think to some extent i think some people are more sensitized by by all that's happened and some people seem to be armored and angry yeah. and so I, 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 you know, I, I can't really answer the question. I think it's a problem because we are, I think we all feel, I think almost everybody, whatever their views, feels overwhelmed. Yeah, that's great. Now, now there's no, it's all personal. There's no right answer. So I just wanted to get your, you know, your, your take on it, what you thought about it. So are there some uh, poems that, reflect on witnessing that you've chosen for us? Yeah. Um, the first poem is not, these are sort of grim, these poems, I apologize. The first poem is not political, it's personal. And I, the reason that I think of it as a witnessing poem is because of my own experience. Um, my husband died about 20 years ago. And at that time, I knew almost I, I, my friends, none of my friends had um, had lost a spouse at that point. And I, I really needed to talk to people who were in the same boat. And I looked for poems that were about my situation. And I found some and they helped me. Um, and then I, I wrote poems myself about uh, my husband's death. So, because I was helped by some poems, I guess I, I always hope that maybe a poem that I wrote about this might help somebody else. And so I think of it as a kind of witnessing. This particular poem um, has at the end of it, the, it talks about gods from the machine. And you probably know, but I'll say in case that, um, in some ancient Greek plays, the play would have everybody get into a terrible mess, tangle, awful. And then at the very end of the play, they evidently had some sort of crane that would bring down an actor playing God and put him on the stage. And that God would fix everything. He'd untie the knots, he'd solve everything, make everything better. Um, and they called, they called it the God from the machine because this crane was some kind of ancient Greek machine. So I just wanted to explain that. Through the looking glass. Overnight, I find myself enrolled in the incredulous tribe, the confraternity of those to jackal habitat deported. The death store ones, the diagnosed, their consorts. My landsmen now, I find I take some comfort in their numbers. I cannot be a freak, I'm one of many. And yet they frighten me, these new companions. Their tightened faces try to keep the secret that candles burn on altars to no purpose that no enactment bars these natural murders, that gods from the machine, like bureaucrats or plumbers, 
are overworked and deaf to rage or prayer. This next poem is the is the grimmest, and I I I, I sort of apologize for reading it. The but I've been thinking about it a lot in the past few months. Um, its title is from a Jacobean play, is the day out of the socket that it is noon at midnight. The violence consultant is the guy who arranges stage fights. God has a whole staff of them. He keeps them busy. In 16th century Hungary, for example, a certain Georgia Dosa led a revolt of Transylvanian peasants. When the nobles captured this hothead, they sat him on a throne, a scalding throne, a red hot iron throne. They put a red hot scepter in his fist, a red hot iron crown atop his head. He was still alive when six of his fellow insurgents were force-fed roasted gobbets from his body. Writing this down, I turn away my mind as if it were an eye. But there are simpler cruelties, like throwing stones at other colored children. Mm. Very powerful. Uh, the next poem is, I think, obviously written in 2020. It's politics and the pandemic. Public health dream. I dreamt of baobabs. They call them upside down trees. Then the habu came, a desert dust storm. Walls of sediment rammed me. The sand seemed to guzzle up the air. I dreamt that scurvy politicians slivers of ice in their hearts, stood on a hillock of mud. They were washing their hands. Lies sallied forth from them as excrement and semen, fibs, half-truths, porkies, alternative facts, a sewage haboob. I hid myself in scutch grass. Meanwhile, the dead piled up. I mean the unrefrigerated dead people of so-called color, bus drivers, orderlies, firemen, food service workers. The air was like minestrone, lies filled it, lies in their aerosol go-karts. The baobabs died. What happened afterward, I can't remember. I drifted away to the empty suburbs of sleep. And the last poem, um, I'm sorry, I feel terrible reading these. No, it's great. They're very intense. I love it. I love it. Um, this poem starts with something called a remote annunciator. I had no idea what this was, but I, I saw a box on the wall in a building and it said remote annunciator. So I looked it up. It's a kind of um, central control panel that... Um, keeps track of all this, the uh, systems in a building or in an airport or a machine and lets you know if things are okay. And they're, the beginning and the end of this have, um, I guess, basically are stolen or adapted from Shakespeare's Tempest. Nothing of us but doth fade. The remote annunciator the central warning panel is silent now. Its lights are out, there's nothing to transmit. Like everything else, the remote annunciator and other apparatuses and baubles are underneath the planet's alpine waters. Slime bejewels them, waffle irons, vacuum cleaners, popcorn makers, cell phones declawed of ringtone. The washing machines are full, but just with water. Their porthole doors flap open with only a putative sound, like the vertical trees when wind uprooted, they toppled. No one to hear their landings, 
their branch dismembering nosedives. In dirty windows water, the teeth of the ocean are working to undo objects' outlines. Rotted sequoias subside onto the yard sale seafloor where all our insubstantial pageants lie. Thanks. Wow. Okay, I need to take a nap now, calm down the intensity. <laughs> no, it's great, fantastic, I love it. Uh, Donna, no two future programs. We gotta start with witnessing. That's really the juicy part. I think we gotta do that, then go refuge. Well, we need <laughs> refuge from the witnessing. That's it. I had it reversed. I got it. We'll, we'll, we'll change it around. Susanna, for next week, we'll, we'll, we'll reverse it. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? I do want to comment, Myra, that um, you said you weren't sure about uh, writing about politics, that you were afraid to lecture or, you know, proselytize or something. Well, you just did it. And you did it beautifully and you did it in a way of witnessing. And I was very moved. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you. It means a lot to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So keep doing it. And by the way, not all poems have to be happiness. What you, what <laughs> it's, those are such important things to, we have to do the breadth of the, our emotions. And you did it beautifully. I, I don't know what else to say. You're so elegant in your words and the presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I, what you said, John, that it would be okay to reach somebody else's poem. You can, I yeah, this, um, is, this I, is just, I, just a to, conversation. Whatever you'd like to do, we can do. Well, I, I this, I, I was thinking about a poem by Wallace Stevens. I mostly I don't understand poems by Wallace Stevens, but when I was, you know, reading these witnessing poems and thinking how grim they are, I thought of a, a very late poem by Wallace Stevens that that I don't exactly understand, but it's it's very beautiful, I think. And it yeah. it um I don't know, it just feels like a place of refuge. So I, I thought maybe maybe I could read that and. Oh yeah, absolutely, that. absolutely. That right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's don't ask me to explain it, but um, it's called "Of Mere Being" and it's short, pretty short. The palm at the end of the mind, beyond the last thought, rises in the bronze decor. A gold feathered bird sings in the palm without human meaning, without human feeling, a foreign song. You know then that it is not the reason that makes us happy or unhappy. The bird sings, its feathers shine. The palm stands on the edge of space. The wind moves slowly in the branches. The bird's fire fangled feathers dangle down. Hmm. It seems a poem about isness it just is and it's a moment of beauty and acceptance to me i don't know if that's what wallace stevens meant but that's how i feel it you know, when i thought about it it's like the you know the bird sings and the feathers shine regardless of mm. whatever else is going on in the world it's like mm. it's like <laughs> stop thinking about it just i don't know just be the bird just sing yeah. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Yeah, Pat Craig was trying to get in. I don't know why you couldn't make the Zoom link work, uh, but I sent him a new link. The Zoom link that I put in the CPL communities was oh, wrong. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I, it changes I had to go every to, week. Yeah, it changes every week. Yeah. I had to go to um the Stockbridge site and yeah, di yeah. dig and I found it. Yeah, okay. So it's my fault. Yep. So Myra, what else what are you working on now? Or are you working on things now? Like a new I book am. or well, I, it hasn't taken shape as a new book, but I have I have a lot of unfinished poems um, because I I find it hard to finish poems, and um, so I'm trying to I'm trying to write new poems and also to finish some old poems and then to see what they add up to. Uh, I don't I don't know yet. Yeah, there must uh, yeah. Whenever you say that, I feel like there must be. Uh an island of unfinished poems <laughs> where they where they uh where they live for a while until they're brought back into uh you know the 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 world yeah it's just interesting yeah there's so many uh, i'm i've written a few poems but I don't, I don't have anything that's that's waiting in the uh the island uh no it's very interesting i i mean obviously you've got you have so much material to work with i mean do you ever cut something from one piece and then put it into another all of a sudden you're looking at two things and you say wait a sec that belongs over here and this one goes over there that's and great you're having a problem with something and you think wait a minute there was that that you know from that other poem then i have to remember which you know find the other poem and oh i can put these together and that solves my problem here and yeah that's that's a great it's a good day when that happens and i i i think you know i also have a sort of thrifty housewife feeling that um, if I worked hard on something, I'd like to use it somewhere, um, but you can't always. Like the reused aluminum foil. Right. Is this, yes, yes, yeah. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a quick question and then I've, I've got to run. Did you, I, I, mean, I may have missed it. Do you do by hand, computer? What's your favorite? Oh, I, um... I start on the computer because it's less, it, it, it's very, it relieves my fear because it's so easy to change things on the computer. You don't have to feel it's, um, but when I start to feel that something is starting to work, I print it out. I can't tell, I can't tell at all anyway, but I can't, certainly can't tell on the computer if, if it maybe works, I have to look at it in the flesh and then i make a lot of changes on the typescript and then i put it back into the computer and so it's a messy process oh that makes per perfect sense because you get your you get your you get the sensory experience of both ways but yeah. there is something about having the piece of paper yes absolutely yeah me anyway you know everybody's different yeah I do the same thing with spreadsheets. I, I usually have to print it out just to look at it because I feel like maybe the computer is tricking me, is changing some <laughs> of the equations. And no, there are a lot of times where I'll print it out and then I'll let's say, let's say 10 times 40 is 400. Why does it say 360? No, no, only kidding. I'm, 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 I'm always, I'm always, I've always got to have it. Take a well, look an email autocorrect sometimes uh, really undoes what you meant. So, but but um, and and sometimes I I have to say that sometimes you know I finish something at night and I think I think this is okay, and then I go back to it in the morning and it's awful, and it I feel as if something has happened overnight to it rather than to me. That not that it's changed the words but it's it's just not what i looked at last night yes yeah, the poetic elves you have to lock stuff up at yes, night yes, exactly. you don't want to leave stuff out because they they get <laughs> at it uh yeah. no my you this know is, we're gonna we're gonna trade out i'm leaving he's coming yeah and we're, we're gonna to about go. to, <laughs> we're gonna go we're gonna bring it to an end in a, in a few minutes but myra so much for coming. um what a fantastic reading. Uh, I will I will rank you as one of the most organized and disciplined readers we've had, you know, because you were just like, I'm gonna do these four things. And you know, so I'm 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 uh no uh no very thoughtful. I, I really appreciate I and 
as I do every week, you know, sharing part of who you are and, and who you are in the creative process, because that really, I think, brings the poems to life when we, we know, you know, when we hear the, you know, the uh, author read them. So I want to thank you. It's been a fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you to the people who came. I, it was a great pleasure and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. And I look forward to listening to some of your other broadcasts. Thank well, you, next week Maris. we got the, you know, we got the double header there. We got Susanna and Margo. So I'll certainly listen to yeah, I'm gonna, Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm going to have to, you know, get some extra sleep before next Thursday because that's going to be explosive. I don't know what the word for it is, Susanna, but it's, it's, uh, no. Uh, no, Myra, thanks again. It's, it's been what a pleasure. Thank you very much. Wendy, I think we're ready to sail off into the blue horizon. Excellent. Myra, thank you very much. And John, as always, thank you very much. Thank you to our audience and I look forward to seeing many of you next week. Yeah, great. Thanks everyone.